to mute your line when you're not speaking. Um, and you can use the chat box as well if you have comments or questions during the presentation. And we'll address those questions and comments in sequence after the presentations have taken place. And also, as usual, this is also a reminder that we are recording the webinar today um, so that we can share it with you and you can share it with your teams for uh, cascading the training to, to your respective teams in your countries. Also, um, this is a kind reminder for anybody who is on social media to, uh, hashtag, to use a hashtag that you see on your screen for ending child marriage. Um, you can also tag us at the handle at Girls Inspire and at Cole4G. So anybody who's on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, um, you can let, let your social media networks know um, what we're up to today. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on the microphone to Mrs. Frances Ferreira who is a senior advisor for the Women and Girls Initiative and the team leader for education at the Commonwealth of Learning to make the welcoming remarks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cherise. Good morning, everybody. Um, I see we are still expecting some people to join us, um, but because of time, uh, we decided to start uh, immediately now and not to wait any longer. Uh, today's topic is... Um, going to be presented by Dr. David Porter, uh, Innovations in Open and Distance Learning. We have been hearing this word the past few years, innovations. What is innovation? What is an innovation? Uh, you should be innovative. Um, and many times people are saying, what exactly is innovation? What can I do to be innovative? Well, we have some examples amongst us, and I think in each of um, your organizations, there's a lot of innovation taking place. Um, we have uh, one very um, impressive innovation in the work that we are doing uh, from the boat schools, Shanivar, where they take, uh, where they're using the boats um, to take the school to the learners because of the fact that learners cannot go to the schools. So that is an innovation. However, today's topic is specifically in open and distance learning. Now, we had a previous webinar on uh, gender in ODL. Um, so today we want to see how we can bring innovation in ODL as we are working towards achieving um, the sustainable development goals and more specifically as we are working towards achieving our goals in the Girls Inspire project. Our speaker today uh, is no stranger to innovation. Dr. David Porter is at the moment the Chief Executive Officer of the eCampus Ontario. Um, and that is the primary face of the Ontario Online Learning Consortium. Um, David is a long is, is a long time advocate for the benefits of adapting new technology to deliver educational opportunities. So he he is indeed then a long time advocate for innovation uh, to deliver education opportunities, and he has been involved in ODL since the 1990s um, and at both the kindergarten to grade 12, K to 12, as well as the higher education levels. Um, he has many, many um, um, impressive positions that he has held over the past how many years. But for the past 11, for 11 years, David was the executive director of BC Campus during his term at BC campus, campus, him and his team engineered Canada's first government-funded open textbook program, a leading-edge move in the higher education in 2012. So this was indeed a huge innovation here in British Columbia, and uh, we have to be grateful for the work that David and his team did at BC camp campus. He also worked as a project leader, a consultant for international open and distance learning projects, and most recently uh, also 
uh, in Mon Mon Mongolia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. He's also the co-editor of the International Journal of E-Learning and Distance Education, an open access journal. So with this information uh, and with this portfolio on Dr. David Porter, I think you all will agree with me that he is indeed the person um, that should speak to this topic tomorrow, uh, this morning, not tomorrow, this morning. So um, without further ado, I want to invite David um, to speak to us for the next 20 minutes. 20 to 25 minutes, after which we will open the floor for discussion where you will be free to ask him. If you at one or other point experience difficulties with your mic, don't be too concerned. You can put in your message, your question in the chat box and uh, we will ensure that uh, that question is responded to. David, from our side also, thank you very much for making the time um, on such short notice for having agreed to speak to our team today. We are indeed looking forward to listen to you. David. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, very much uh, very pleased to be here this morning uh, in uh, Ontario time, and I realize it's evening in other parts of the world, but uh, I'm enjoying the opportunity to speak with you. Um, since its inception, open and distance learning has really benefited from technological changes, and in particular, the Internet which have provided faster ways of distributing learning materials to learners worldwide. But I heard Francis talk about the way that some of you are bringing education to students by boat, and that in itself is also an innovation. It's a technology, essentially, that you have complete control over and can mold and manipulate to suit a need that presents in your area of practice. And so I think it's wonderful that it doesn't have to be a high-tech innovation to be effective as long as it solves a problem. Um, I'm not seeing the slides on my screen on my end, so I am uh, counting on Francis or Charisse to move the slides for us. But what I want to talk about first um, is what is an innovation and how does an innovation um, get moved forward. Many of the core innovations that we think about technologically, like television, radio, and mobile phones, have played a role in our lives, and they also have an opportunity to play a role in the lives of distance learners. And these innovations, in most cases, were developed in well-funded laboratories and built in factories well beyond a scale which any of us can really influence. So the question we're left with often is where can we as educators be innovators and what specifically is an innovation? On your screen, you'll see a definition of innovation that I find very helpful. And it's really about solving problems with new ideas. And that's where it starts. It's about questions and problems and obstacles that you find in your life or your work. And you find a creative way to solve that problem that makes a difference for others. When we think about the problem space that we work in as educators, it tends to be bounded by what I would call the atomic structure of learning. There are some elements in that atomic structure that we can manipulate and make innovative for our learners. And what I mean by that is that learners come to us with a goal in mind, and we build courses and programs and training to suit their needs. So it's in this problem space that we as educators need to find our inspiration. It's not about big scale technologies like television or radio or computers that we can't really influence the core technology. 
what we can do is influence how it affects learners. And that means that we have to look closely the innovations to, that can influence learning outcomes or the way we assess learning so that people can find and understand and realize the success they want, or in the resources that we make available for them to learn through, or the teaching activities that we create that engage students and make them effective learners. These are the primary areas we can affect through innovation. So what I really want to talk about is only one innovation today, one of innovation that's come on the scene in the past 10 years that continues to grow and continues to pri provide opportunities for educators like yourselves, like myself, to make lives better for our learners. So what I want to talk about is making education truly open. And when I say that, I mean making it open in the sense that anyone can have access to learning resources that suit their needs at any time, and that those resources are completely malleable and moldable to suit a particular situation. And we find that when we build learning resources, one of the things we always have to keep in mind is that we work in different cultures, we work in different contexts, and for learning to be truly effective, it has to be open so that we can customize it to the needs of the people we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So the question is, why is open and that concept of openness so important? Well, for me, it's pretty straightforward. Why open? Because openness is really the way that education is created. It's about sharing knowledge. And a significant date for the world is 1948. And it was in 1948 that through the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was created. And it is that declaration that says everyone has the right to education. Education shall be free, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. And that is the genesis of the whole notion of education for all, that we all deeply believe as educators that everybody has a right to education, whether they live in a city, a village, in a rural community on a river, education should be available to them. And so the question that arises from that is, how do we make that education available to people? And what is the power that is available to us? And how does that play out in the real world where people are learning? An excellent example comes from Swaziland, where open educational resources and open practices have been used to redevelop curriculum resources and lower the costs of nursing and training programs. There's a problem. How do we make education of nurses more accessible? How do we bring the best resources possible to those nursing students? And how do we use them effectively in the context in which we live and operate? That is one of the power equations that is available to us through the open community. So I want to just continue from there and talk about a few other examples of openness that work in the health education space and just give you a couple of examples. So open education and healthcare is another part of fundamental rights. People across the world believe that healthcare is a universal access issue and that we all should have access to good health care. We can't do that unless we have trained practitioners and that we have resources that everyone can use and that they are effective in multiple contexts. Surely no one competes over health care. Health care is a human right 
and we should be making as many healthcare resources available as possible to anyone. While I was working in Mongolia from 2010 until 2014, I showed a lot of educators there Khan Academy, an online video tool to distribute lessons to students who had access to video. And one of the groups that I showed it to was the healthcare community at the Mongolian Academy of Health Sciences. And immediately they saw a problem that they were trying to solve. How do we train rural physicians effectively and how could we roll out examples of good healthcare practices to those physicians using video? And so one of the first things they did was take the Khan Academy model and adapt it to healthcare training in Mongolia and began to voice over videos that they could find on YouTube, some that were created by universities in the United States and in Africa, showing things like rural healthcare procedures, emergency surgery procedures, and they began to translate and voice over those materials in their own language. What made that possible was that all of the resources that they could find were completely open for them to repurpose, translate, and recreate in their own context. This is an innovation of power. This is a powerful way of providing tools to educators to make ideas and knowledge freely available across a broader population. Developed countries like Canada find this fascinating as well, that many of these innovations that have started in other parts of the world work equally well in our environment too. And so the next slide shows you some textbooks for nursing that have been developed in different locations, but have been repurposed using their open opportunity. That is, the materials are freely available, the materials are provided so that people can reuse them, and they've begun to actively do that to build better materials for our nursing students. These are all publicly available on the internet. They could fit other contexts too if translated and localized. There are some real opportunities for bi-directional work between work that is created anywhere in the world being localized somewhere else. And I think that that was the opportunity that my Mongolian colleagues saw from videos that were created in Africa on rural health and how those could equally be useful in their context in Central Asia. Now, across the world these days, more and more of the core instructional resources that students use in universities and high schools are becoming available open and freely. Some examples include very high-cost materials that are often required for science courses. These, these materials are often very much uh, out of the reach of cost for students who struggle to find ways to pay for them. And one of the things that we are now finding is that when we provide free materials to students at the beginning of their course, accessible to them to use on any device or have printed copies made locally, they're more successful in their courses because they have not had to worry about whether they can afford the resource or whether the resource is current enough for their use, but that it works effectively for them. Many of our nursing students are finding that the core text they use, anatomy and physiology, is a great example of a, of a text that works across many science professions. And because it's available 
for faculty members and instructors to take apart and use only parts of, or reuse parts of, or simply assign for study parts of it, it becomes a very customizable resource that works well for students. If we look at the next slide, we're seeing these kinds of libraries developing all across the world, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, everywhere. And it's all based on a key assumption, and that is that we should be granting freedoms instead of imposing restrictions, that the sharing is a fundamental component of teaching, and collaboration is a good thing. My colleague, David Wiley, who has been working in this space for 15 years and who came up with the idea of open content, believes it is the way forward. That if you are not sharing, if you are not open as an educator, teaching and learning are not as effective as they could be. So the big idea, the big innovation tied to openness is the notion that instructional resources that enable learning and teaching increase in value because they are free and more importantly, because they are open. As you may know, UNESCO has been very supportive of the notion of providing open resources everywhere and allowing people to copy, share, translate, redistribute, and remix materials to suit particular purposes. In the Western world, we're very concerned about copyright, and so copyright has become the idea that we have innovated with. We have taken the principles of copyright, that someone creates a work and can decide how it is used, and decided to use it in a much more expansive manner so that others can benefit. And so through Creative Commons, we've created a licensing model that allows people to distribute work more efficiently, more effectively, and allow more innovative uses to happen. So a simple standardized way of working forward. And we'll just keep going with the slides until we get to the next one, which talks about benefits. And you can continue to push there. And if you're familiar with openness, it all it has to do with licenses and the notion of spreading the word far beyond where things are created. It's about giving instructors the ability to customize and contextualize resources for their students. That is something within their control. I talked about at the beginning that we as educators have a scope in which we can probably innovate most effectively. Things to do with learning outcomes, things to do with assessment, things to do with resources, things to do with teaching practices. These are areas where we can be very effective. But we have to actually provide these resources so that people can find them. And if you see the next slide, you'll see how we're beginning to build libraries that invite instructors to find materials, to adopt the materials, and tools to help them modify the materials so that they can become more effective for use in their area. This is an innovation that is big and continuing to grow. Let's continue and just flip through some of those slides. You get a sense. But it's more than just a good idea. There is already research demonstrating that this innovation not only leads to more use of free materials, it also leads to more success, and that students do better when they have access to high quality materials that are customized from them, for them. And the next slide shows an example of that kind of research that is happening currently. This is a study, a published study, that shows that the outcomes are better when instructors and teachers have access to resources 
they can customize and make more appropriate for their students. Another benefit, um, and what I'm calling the beyond free benefit number three, is that students and instructors can begin to work together to build resources. And this is what we would call an authentic learning activity, something that benefits learning, has a better outcome, and allows instructors to assess what students are doing in a more authentic manner. And the next slide shows a textbook on chemistry that is extremely popular. 5.5 million viewers per month come to this student-created chemistry textbook that an instructor has created with his students and allows each successive intake of his students to edit, improve, and make more useful for their peers. That's an important part of learning, being fully engaged in not only understanding the material you're, you're working with, but also helping create new material for your peers to make learning more effective for them. It's not only instructors, it's also teachers that uh, can work together more effectively. We're finding that librarians like to work together to create resources that are more useful for instructors and students. And one of the ways that we've begun to enable this innovation is to use the concept of a sprint, like a race, a short period of time in which a group of teachers or instructors get together to solve a task together. We have a problem. Librarians have a problem. How do we make open resources more and better known to our teachers in our schools. Well, they got together to build a common set of resources that would be used in all libraries to help teachers understand the value in using these open resources. Next slide shows teachers working together to create their own textbook. A group of geography instructors decided that they wanted a local geography textbook that would be more meaningful to their students. So they got together over a period of five days and they collaboratively wrote a textbook, uh, gathered images from the internet, uh, gathered text materials, gathered freely available maps and other image resources, worked with writers, worked with illustrators, work with librarians to build textbooks that were meaningful to their students. It's a textbook sprint. Often we need to look at assessment as well, and one of the ways to do that that we found is effective is to have instructors work together on a common problem. Innovate assessment models that work across multiple schools and across multiple subject disciplines so that we're beginning to deal with not only lightening the load for creating those assessments, but also creating a high quality set of assessment resources that a number of schools and teachers together can benefit from. We call that a test bank sprint. But it goes beyond that. And one of the most interesting models that's starting to emerge is to use another innovation that's come along over the past few years and to marry it, bring it together with the open ideas to create something even bigger. And so you've probably all heard of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. But often these courses um, require technologies that allow you to use video and, and other kinds of high-end technological resources, and that doesn't work in every context. So we need to think differently. And so one of my favorites is one created through the Commonwealth of Learning, and it is about working with a massive open online course that works with small mobile devices and is 
targeted at a particular subject area in a rural community, horticulture. These kinds of ideas, taking open resources, marrying them to mobile technologies, making them available to thousands of people for free, is really an innovation that builds on top of another innovation. It is that kind of synergy is incredibly powerful. A very interesting new concept for higher education will begin in March 2017 through the Open Education Resource Universitas. And it is a collection of 35 universities and worldwide from India, South Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, South Africa, Great Britain, Ireland, Scotland, who are working together to put together a completely free first year course of study at the university, of, university level for students to study by themselves on their own time using mobile or computer technologies. What is interesting about this is not only do you get to study for free, there is also a credential, an authentic credential associated with it. And so to lower the costs for students and to use all of the open principles, these institutions have worked together to put free programs of study available. And what students will be asked to pay for is assessment only. So a different model of practice growing out of open. No course fees, no materials costs, just assessment. This is how an innovation grows from a small idea of making materials free and open. It begins to morph and grow into a new and bigger idea. Look for OERU.org and look for the first year course of study that it will begin to offer starting in March 2017. Now it's only going to grow from there. And there are other technologies that are going to interface with these ideas. <coughs> and one of them is the notion that fuels internet commerce, and in particular distributed commerce, like the kind of commerce that Bitcoin and blockchain technologies begin to support. There is an opportunity to go far beyond where we are now to allow people to take courses and um, materials and learning opportunities from around the world and bind them together into an authentication pathway that will allow them to be certified at low or no cost. And this is starting to happen right now. So just in summary, if you want to be an innovator, if you want to be effective in innovation, it's really about four things. It's about a problem, a difficult challenge that invites new ideas. It's about organizational support that welcomes that kind of creativity. Your organization, your school, your department of education is supportive of bringing people together to try new things, those sprint ideas that I showed you. It's space to experiment and also to fail if necessary. Not every idea that we try to implement works. And we need to recognize that the idea is really to fail early. To try things, but to decide quickly whether they are working or not. And one thing that every innovator needs to sustain their enthusiasm and to help them get beyond the thorniest of problems is passion, that they believe they have an idea that will help overcome a real problem and benefit learners. 
And I invite you to think about what kinds of problems you'd like to solve, who could help you solve it, and how you might go about that in improving the lives of learners in your own community. And I'll stop there, Francis, in case there are questions. Can you hear, can people indicate to me whether they can hear me? <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you very much, David. That was a wow presentation. Um, I personally got very much inspired by the sprint ideas. Um, I think there's a lot of um, issues that you have raised uh, that the team that's now uh, in the room can either identify with or that they can say, I can take this into my context and see how I can use that idea. Um, because as you say, the conditions for uh, innovations, um, the one is to know the challenges, to understand what the problem is in order for us to find the solution. I like the sprint ideas. Um, I like the, the issue of collegial collaboration. I think that is something that anybody in any team, if there is a space, uh, an enabling space within that organization, um, can try. Within the work that we are doing, I think the colleagues would um, see now the value of um, the value of finding what resources are available amongst the team, say, for instance, in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, and see how the different organizations can adopt each other's material and modify it. Uh, so you have addressed many things that were there before for some people, but some people maybe may not have heard about it. But I think this is an excellent um, um opportunity now colleagues to ask David to clarify or for him to give you more advice on an idea that you have that links with uh, what he has said or for him to give more information on a specific idea that you want to hear more from. I will now um, ask anybody who has a question uh, to come in. We will see on the screen and then uh, we will ask you to speak. Salim from Tanzania. Can David, can you see the chat box? Okay, you can see. Okay, I'm opening the floor. Anybody who wants to make a comment? Mustafa? Take the floor. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, good morning, Francis and uh, uh, David. It's a very nice presentation. Actually, you explained the term innovation in uh, teaching, learning is a, in a very uh, nice way. Especially, you identified the points, uh, the, the problem. If there is no problem, there is no challenge, the innovation usually doesn't come in. This, the most important thing you mentioned is the organizational support. So, if it is not supported by the organization, then it becomes difficult to, to bring some, some ideas to uh, its uh, mature level. So this is uh, very important too. So uh, one question of, uh, may I ask you uh, regarding uh, the sharing of the, uh, the resources. Uh, so if we think of OER, uh, actually uh, a lot of materials are available uh, as OER, uh, we, we see different uh, repositories are there. But if you like to uh, use it for the local context where the language is a problem, culture is a problem, I mean uh, there are some differences in culture, language, etc. So uh, what uh, will be your suggestion in that regard? So if our partners or uh, our rural, for our rural uh, people or women who are actually uh, are facing a lot of problems with uh, 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 their culture and, and language. So how we can adjust these things uh, when they will adapt uh, the uh, uh, free resources, open resources. Thank you very much. Thanks. 
You're welcome. Yes, you're pointing out an extremely real, real problem. And the issue is organizational support. And so when I gave you the example uh, of recent work I've done in Mongolia, which is an economy that is just de developing a very rural population, the government and, and leaders there, NGOs, have been somewhat proactive in trying to scale up small, defined projects. So one of the projects that they decided to work on was to create some video that would be useful in the Mongolian context in their language. And so they did two things. One, they looked for examples like the Khan Academy videos, and they started by experimenting with the voice track, taking the English voice track out and putting the Mongolian voice track in. But that did not fully satisfy them. And so what they began to do was then to start creating their own examples of those videos and created a very small number to test in their schools to see if they were effective and then went back to government to say, we believe this is effective. We believe it works best when our Mongolian colleagues create based on the model and do it in Mongolia and that the examples we use match our style of teaching and our cultural context. So I think it's a process of starting small. I am a proponent of design-based research. So design-based research comes from the premise that you rarely get something right the first time you try it. And it is through iterative cycles of building and testing, usually three cycles, that you begin to build the principles for a model that will work in your context. So that's what I would recommend, that you start small, get some organizational support to try one innovative model to suit a particular problem you have, but think about it as an iterative approach that you will not only build, but test, and then make a decision on whether to proceed or stop. Thank you very much, David, um, for that elaborate response. Um, Cherise, do you want to take the chair? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we've got one question coming in from Salim Mapanda from Kihuwere in Tanzania. Salim, I invite you to unmute your line and um, speak out your question so everybody can hear you. Okay, okay, there you go. Hi, Salim, go ahead. Thank you, but I'm sorry, where I am now, uh, there is a lot of noises that I can't speak, but if you can persist, I can proceed. <laughs> proceed. <laughs> Please proceed, Salim. We can hear you quite well. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. So, um, my question was, how can these materials found in those um, resources, especially most of them are found from the internet, um, I wanted to understand if there is compatibility with other countries, especially in their curriculum and the way of presenting them, because I found some of resources are editable and anyone can put his contribution that can mislead um, the learners. As we know that uh, nowadays people are trusting internet sources and some of them are misled because of these resources. So I wanted to know the authenticity and the security to protect the, the clear and the true uh, materials. Yep, I so think how can we protect them? Th that's a very Thank good you. question. Um, I think the authenticity comes from where they are stored. So if the repository that you are drawing materials from 
is a repository supported by a university or a college or a government or a well-known NGO, then I think you can have a high level of confidence that the materials are good and authentic. But I think the philosophy of openness means that we want and we invite educators to actually pick those materials and use them and customize them to suit the needs of their own students. I don't think we are necessarily saying just use them as you find them. I think we are saying make sure it comes from a repository that you trust, that is reviewed, and fits into a category of knowledge providers that you would feel confident about. And the second is that um, we expect, for the most part, that people are going to do positive things with learning resources and use them for their intended purpose. It seems like a terrible waste of time for someone to actually go in and uh, corrupt a resource which was intended for positive use. And so that's where the professional education and judgment of yourselves as educators comes in, that you review the resources before you recommend them to your students, and that you, when you change or update or modify or remix or redistribute those resources, have confidently stated that I believe this is a good resource that will result in learning. I think being overly concerned about the security of the resource detracts from openness. Thank you very much, Salim, for that question. I think that is a very important one in terms of ensuring quality. And thank you very much, um, David, for clarifying that. Uh, we see some comments in the chat box saying that it's a very authentic and inspirational lesson and um, the emphasis on design-based research, uh, which is a point from Dr. Porter. Um, if there's any other questions or comments, please unmute your phone or type into the chat box and we can address them here. We have um, about five more minutes to go. So uh, we'd like to take advantage of this um, expert in our room to draw from. Um, I, I was wondering, um, I remember when I was in Pakistan, um, we discussed this issue of, and of, of um, working together and uh, trying to adapt, adopt and adapt the materials from each other. Um, is there any of you in the room right now who are working within your country? country? with one of the partner organizations um, to adopt their materials and going through a process of adaptation or who are planning and need some advice? It's a very quiet class today. Normally we have lots of questions. Yes, Can I talk, Francis? Yes, please proceed, Mustafa. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, already you started one, uh, you uh, helped Bangladesh Open University to develop a policy for the institutional uh, we are, uh, adaption and, and development. So it is going on, maybe uh, we are planning to implement it to uh, develop some materials as we are and the existing materials we are like trying to put the license on it so it is it was EU initiated so we got the policy and now it is uh, going to be a national policy so another policy is coming out to base just started from there so we are getting the second phase of the policy uh, at national level so uh, and uh, the, the Prime Minister's office of, of, of Bangladesh planning to put a uh, 
to the resources they got. So they got several types of resources, especially the digital resources, reduce, etc. So they are planning to put all these resources into a repository under uh, uh, that policy, putting some licenses. So these are the development from Bangladesh Open. Since it was, it, it was your initiative, that's why I mentioned that. So uh, we can, uh, if any partner wants to share this, so we can we can uh, uh, help them to connect with that. Thank, Thank you, you, Mustafa. Thank you, um, Dr. Porter. This project within this project, there is um, sort of some condition uh, for partners when they develop learning resources that they do license it under one of the Creative Commons licenses. Number one. Um, number two, there is also uh, within uh, this by implicitly we are saying we are encouraging them to use OER and to build on that. Um, you are making a good point in saying that um, adaptation usually needs organizational support and I want to believe that in within these organizations where this specific project is um, situated in the different countries within these organizations that we do have uh, the organizational um, support uh, and by way of committing to the Commonwealth of Learning that yes, we are prepared to work towards developing more OER and to share it with other partners uh, is a further um, sort of some evidence that there is this um, commitment from the organization. Uh, we are also, uh, um, is it, we are also fortunate enough to have some of the CEOs of these organizations with us in the room at the moment. I see um, Mrs. Banu from Bangladesh. I see um, Saria from uh, Pakistan. Um, so they are the CEOs of these organizations. So if they had any doubt about um, adaptations, uh, about OER, I think your presentation this morning would have given them uh, more insight. Uh, usually also after the webinar, we do share the recording of the webinar with everybody to go through, and that goes with the slides uh, that you have presented. So I was also thinking that if there are any queries or questions uh, from the team afterwards, we normally also send out to them a post-webinar evaluation survey, a short survey. So if there's anything that's coming up from that, we will also communicate with you in order for us to get more answers to such queries. In the meantime, I've seen there's a lot of chat here, if there is something that I need a person to give chance to talk, I'll give to Cherise to, to let me know. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, we're receiving um, messages from Salim in Tanzania mentioning how the structure works uh, within the Partnership for Girls Inspire. So um, Salim is saying in the chat box that Kihiweta runs an open school where vulnerable girls are studying. Most of the materials for schooling are from the Institute of Adult Education, which is another partner of G Girls Inspire and other Open University of Tanzania. And these materials are adapted to suit the need for open school. Salim, if you have anything to add there, I invite you to, again, unmute your phone. Um, in the meantime, we're getting um, some really good advice here in the chat box from uh, Dr. Porter regarding policy and organizational support, which means uh, receiving training tools, um, editorial expertise, graphic design expertise to ensure the quality of the outputs of the materials. Um, it's also great that uh, from what Francis had mentioned, we're continuing the conversation beyond this webinar, um, and we're, we're going to take whatever uh, feedback you provide us in those evaluation forms. Um, and raise those questions in, within our community of practice. Uh, an initiative that Mustafa from Bangladesh Open University is leading is that he's um, creating follow-up conversations on our online community of practice at girlsinspire.org so we can also continue the conversation there. 
and Dr. Porter, will, we're happy to share the link with you where that conversation is taking place. Um, so we have a few more minutes for questions or comments before we go to the um, closing remarks. Salim, thank you. We, we got your message that you're on transit, and we really appreciate you joining us and being really active in your participation despite uh, being on the move, which is the beauty of open and distance um, technologies. So thank you very much. So if there's any other questions or comments, please type them in, and uh, in a few minutes' time, we'll proceed to the closing remarks. Okay, I think there's no other comments. Um, I would like to use this opportunity to ask David if he has um, a last-minute uh, contribution to make, if he wants to say something in closing before I sort of say my thank yous, David. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really my pleasure today to be a part of this short conversation on innovation. And I think the, the lesson um, to take away for me is that one person can be the initiator of an innovation that grows to include many others. And as teachers and educators, we most often can affect kind of atomic structure of learning, the things that happen around learning outcomes and assessment models, the way education is delivered, the delivery model, the teaching practices, and the kinds of resources we use. Those are usually under our control in some way as teachers or educators, and those are the places to start. It's pretty hard to affect the larger scale infrastructure or the core technologies themselves. So I encourage you to work with what you have and do the best you can with it and to invite colleagues to play with you. Thank you very much, David. And once again, thank you so much for having agreed to speak to us. Uh, this was really uh, a wonderful um, opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I want to thank each and other, each and every person who, are, who who made time this morning to join us. We know we had more than the number that's in the room at the moment who confirmed, but we're also appreciative of the fact that they may have experienced um, technical difficulties or any other unforeseen circumstances. So we really appreciate the time that you have made to come into the room and to, to listen to this presentation. These are all building blocks as we expand your capacity in certain areas uh, because nobody is an empty vessel. We all come with lots of ideas and uh, competencies and skills already. But we also believe in lifelong learning. So anything new that we can learn, anything new that uh, can add value to um, the way we deliver our work, uh, would add to our own productivity, but also to the organization. And in the end, it will contribute to make a change in the world where we live. So thank you very much. Um, I see there's more questions coming for David, uh, but he has answered them. So thank you very much. Um, have a good evening. Have a good day. Take care. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.